the thing that's the most important for me as a documentarian is really, you just have to put the time in. You just have to be with people. And it's those, it's a collection of small moments that give you the best impression of the whole. Don Porter, thank you so much for joining the Austin Meyer podcast. We are um, split by the entire country right now in Massachusetts and in California. And uh, it's so great to, to meet you here in kind of virtually in person. Um, and I first want to just start off the uh, show by thanking you for these amazing works of art, these amazing works of journalism and his- history um, in the films that you've come out with this year. And uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into how these things came about and also how you developed an interest in documentary filmmaking um, that, that puts you where you are today. So thank you so much for joining the show. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I love, I, I love the premise of your show. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So you've had what looks like quite, quite a busy year. I know for a lot of documentarians, you know, you might have one film come out every couple years, every few years. Um, you've had two films, very public films, come out in the span of just a, uh, a few months they were released between. What was that like for you this year going through those two releases, how they lined up with this political cycle, which they were so intertwined with? Um, what was that like for you this year? Um, you know, uh, it, it was it was definitely different. I mean, um, I didn't mean to release two movies <laughs> at the same time. I certainly didn't mean to release them in a pandemic. Um, I had been working on the John Lewis movie for a while, and then the producers, um, Laura Dern and Evan Hayes, Evan produced Free Solo. Uh, Laura works with a woman, uh, Jamie Lemons. And, you know, when they approached me about the Sousa doc, we were kind of three quarters in to the John Lewis film. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't resist the, you know, the Sousa doc. Um, And, you know, I thought like, okay, this is possible. You know, I I was, um, you know, one thing about all films is is nobody makes them alone. So... Mm -hmm. You know, at this point in my career, um, I, Je- it also interesting is Jessica Congdon edited both films. Oh, wow. So, Shout yeah. out to Jessica. Shout out to Jessica. So, <laughs> you know, we were very much in sync on the John Lewis movie, and we mm-hmm. had a really good, you know, kind of working language together. Um, so it was very easy for us to be like pencils down on John Lewis and just, she went right into Sousa. So while she was finishing, you know, we were finishing the edit on John Lewis movie, I started shooting on Sousa movie. Mm. So by the time, so we had like, and that's, that's kind of like standard is you want to get, I like to get, you know, a decent amount of footage shot before the editor comes in, but not all of it because okay. I really like to collaborate with the editors and, you know, make sure that there's room to shoot what they are craving for the film. Mm, mm. So, so if you shoot the whole thing and then hand somebody something, it's a much different experience than if you're, sh- if you're like halfway shot or three quarters mm. of the way shot. And then there's like, Oh, you know, what would be great is if we had X. Right. So that was like the relationship I have. And, and I'm working with her again now, like just, the, but what I love about that story is that um, Pete Sousa and John Lewis are totally different movies. They're different stylistically, they're different in pacing, they're different in approach. And so I think it shows like the flex, or both of our flexibility mm-hmm. in style. And I love that Jess, like her, you know, our, all, all of our movies are different. And I, right. and I love that. Like, so the commonality is the story. It's mm. not the form. Right. And, and that is what's so cool about documentary is that there is that flexibility to go reinvent yourself, to explore, you know, Absolutely. you don't have to just do things in one style. 
So. Absolutely. And so when you when you look at those two documentaries and, and you talk about the commonalities between the stories, what are what are some of those commonalities that you see um, that kind of make these two films coming out in tandem with each other in some sense um, really feel like they fit? I feel like um, the Pete Sousa movie is almost a sequel to John Lewis' mm. story. Yeah. Um, and not in the traditional sense, but if you think about the, the heart of John Lewis's message, it is speak up, use your voice. And that's exactly what Pete Sousa was doing. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's also in the John Lewis movie, history is really important and not just reciting history, but seeing it. You know, you have to see those images to take the emotion from that time. And that's what I wanted to do with John Lewis is to say, here are some of the things you know, but let's fill those, let's fill in some pieces that you may not have known, Mm -hmm. but also give the audience enough of the ability to see the video from the past to make their own conclusions about it. So instead of compressing his moment on the bridge to just the march and the beating, like we wanted to back it up to what was the planning for it? Right. What was the, you know, like what went into it? Mm-hmm. Um, so by the time you get to that climactic moment that people have seen, you really understand John Lewis didn't just show up on a bridge. They planned for months, you know, if not years of what they were going to do. And then for, for Pete, it's um, he's watching this history unfold And it's also this cumulative experience as he's photographing President Obama and even President Reagan, he's thinking about all the other photographs that he's made over eight years. Yep. And so Pete becomes kind of every man, like this is important to document. John Lewis would not be the seminal figure he is if we didn't have documentation of what he did. And now Pete is creating that documentation that's not just for now, but it's for the future. Someday, 50 years from now, somebody's going to look back to Pete's photos and say, this is what happened then. Just like I looked back in John Lewis to say, this is what happened 50 years ago. So I I really see them like on this continuum, even though they may seem (laughs) totally unrelated to me, they're so related. And I think Jessica got that too. Absolutely. And, and Pete has such just a keen awareness as well of, of that historical perspective and that respect for the position and this being an account of history. So when we think about documentation and its importance, I want to, I'd love to get a little bit of your background and, and when did being a documentarian yourself really feel like something that you wanted to dedicate your life to because documentary filmmaking is uh it's not it's not the easiest smoothest road the so pain of heart no that's right that's right so yeah. t- take us back a little bit to your journey yeah um i i am a lawyer um so i went to georgetown law school i practiced for five years at a law firm and then I went to uh, ABC television versus in-house counsel, and then to ABC News as uh, director of news standards and practices. And the way that my boss set up that job is we would read scripts and watch cuts. We used to get VHS tapes, <laughs> <laughs> which now it seems like it's they were chiseled in stone. But so this cart would arrive with a script and screeners of these uh, investigative pieces, you know? And so the job was not what can you say legally, it's what should you say as a journalist? It's what are the ethics of the journalism? And she really impressed upon me that the process of gathering information is almost as important or maybe as important as what information you put out. Hmm. So if you don't gather things in an ethical way, you lead, it leads to mistrust and, uh, you know, and her point was, if we lose the confidence of the public, if we lose their belief, you know, really like it's, it's bad for society. Like we are lost and look how right she was, you know? Right. So this was like back in 2000. So that's 20 mm-hmm. years ago. My boss was thinking about that already. So, um, you know, so 
watching, it, it turns out that if you watch really good reporters craft an eight minute story or a three minute story or a half an hour story, if you watch that process of taking a lot of information, synthesizing it and making it not just, you know, understandable, but making it like creative and engaging right. that. So that was kind of my film school is watching mm. that process of how an interview gets, you know, a half an hour interview gets to be a three minute piece. That's really compelling. You know, that's your evening news. Um, so I, you know, I did that job for like six years. And so I probably saw thousands of hours of interviews and, and I would read the transcripts of the interviews. So you start to see like how people craft questions to get, you know, full answers. You see like who's good at it, who like is trying to get a specific answer and is, is, you know, um, so it was really, Leading really question or like Leading kind of question. fishing for something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were some reporters who would have written out their whole piece and then go look for interview bites to drop in. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Ooh, I never want to do that. And then there were some reporters who were like, had just done their homework and would ask these questions that would really elicit thoughtful answers. And then they would craft something. And I was like, I want to do that. So after you do that for a little while, you start to get like itchy. It's like, I want to ask the questions. I don't want to just read the question. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So there was, there was, that was like kind of the seed. And then I left ABC News and I went to A&E Television. So, and this was like at the time that reality television was really like getting popular, but it turns out that it's very difficult to do, you know, for a 13 episode order, people aren't going to let you follow people around for three years. So reality started to get not so real. And so that got to be like kind of frustrating to me because I was coming from a news and journalism background where you don't create the story, you cover the story. And it started to be a little more like you're covering it. So, so there was that, that I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's like existential going, was, crisis here. Yeah, Sorry, where, exactly. What am I, you're right. right. And, and then, um, I just started to, I got to this place where I could start to read a script or watch a screener. And I was giving like what I thought were like creative notes. They weren't like, you know, what's the source for this? It was really like, I got bored here or I don't understand this or da, 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 da. And so it just kind of planted it. So, but what actually one thing that happened is we had this project um, by a filmmaker that and this happens all the time in cable like there's there's like some extra budget they commission something somehow i don't know how this happens but somehow they don't pay attention to it and then when the rough cut comes in it's it was terrible and um i i don't know i decided like i was gonna save this thing like nobody cared about it they were like ah we'll just write it off we won't put it on and i was like no 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 i think i can help they brought it to me for like the reporting is kind of thin, like, what do we do on this? And I was, so I kind of like dug in and like did some interviews. <laughs> I totally not yeah. <laughs> job. <And> nobody <laughs> cared because right. they were ready to write it off. So they're like, sure, if you want to try and help it, okay. Um, and then, so I kind of got this suggestion in my mind that like maybe all this experience I have from news and from watching all thousands of hours of you know, real life news or, or, you know, docu-style filmmaking, maybe I know how to do something. So then I just had to find, but, you know, I am a lawyer. So I was like, Hmm, how am I going to make a living doing this? Of course, so I right. pay myself. Like I couldn't quit my job. I had a good job as a vice president at a cable company, you know, like yeah. the, it was, it was good, good deal. Yeah. Um, so I started going to like, festivals and conferences and just sitting in on all of these like sessions on how to make a film, how to get a film funded. What are people buying? I did that for like a year. I would use like my vacation time to go to, to film conferences um, and, and then kind of network. And by then I had a really good network. You know, I had all these people on cable. I went to like real screen. I went to all these like different you know places as the executive Mm -hmm. But I went to all the, the breakout sessions for creating. 
And then um, I finally got introduced to um, the public defenders from a contact of mine, uh, Kirsten Levingston, who was a lawyer and she was working at Ford Foundation and she introduced me to the public defenders. And I was like, oh my gosh, like someone needs to tell their story. So I didn't really like think I was becoming a documentarian. I just wanted to interview them and find out what was going on. Yeah. It so just kind of kept kept chasing that interest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh wow. There's so many so many questions that are coming up for me here. Um so if we if we look at okay, that that background and then we zoom forward again to to where we are in this year and the in these two movies of yours that came out. Um one thing, one thing that I just heard in that background of yours was was this idea of like an interest and a appreciation for letting the story kind of play out in front of you and allowing yourself to be surprised by the reporting, allowing yourself to um, go where the story takes you. So yeah. if we start with the with the first movie of yours that you were working on um, in the sequence, the John Lewis movie, Good Trouble. I'm interesting how that played out and how you approached the project from a storytelling perspective at the outset, because I imagine like you know, know the history, you know where his positions and stances are today. And it could be very easy to kind of like just have, have like that base outline script and then like go execute on that. So how did you, how did you start that story and what did you have kind of in place in your mind and what were you like, let's discover this as we go? Yeah. Um, you know, I think for, for John Lewis, like um, it was really important to me to find some active story to follow because the thing I love to do the most is just sit with a camera and watch people live and see what is influencing them. And I felt like, the part of John Lewis's story that was the least examined was his current day activity. What does a civil rights icon do on a day-to-day -day basis? And it turned out he was doing a lot, you know, he was doing a lot of legislation, um, but he was really uh, out on the campaign trail working for the Democrats. And, and I, that kind of captured my imagination is if you think of, John Lewis, like his provenance, like where he comes from, it's in, in activism. Mm -hmm. And so how do you become an activist legislator? Like right. first he's knocking on the doors of the halls of power, trying to get Lyndon Johnson to sign a civil rights bill. And then he is in the halls of power conducting a hearing. So, so I was very interested in like, what is he doing now? I really wanted to bring him into the present. Um, but then I thought the way to, to understand how important and, you know, cool it is, like his current job, that we should then look back and see, like, what are all the forces that brought him to this place where he would run unopposed and he could use all of his power and influence to campaign for three first time representatives. I mean, John, right. everybody and their mother wanted John Lewis to come out for them, especially in the South. Mm -hmm. And he, the people he was choosing to help were like Lizzie Fletcher, you know, a small race in, in, you know, Texas, um, Colin Allred, same thing. Um, so, you know, he was helping the heavy hitters like Stacey Abrams, but he was also helping the little people. And I thought that's so John Lewis that he would spend his precious time you know, campaigning so hard for all these first timers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I wanted to find the active story and then look back. And then in the active story, which is in the present day, then I started to see like, oh, in some ways, like the Congressman was becoming like a postage stamp, like a statue. Right. He wasn't yeah. a li living, breathing person. So I was like, as I got to know him, I was like, he's just such a charming funny, um, peaceful person, not perfect person, but like, I, I thought like, it's very hard for young people these days to think that they can do something great. And by showing him living and being silly, he's not always like 
making amazing speeches. Sometimes he's feeding cats, you know, like he <laughs> wants to make yeah. him a person. So, and he was a very game for that. Like he just um, was such a peaceful person and had complete comfort with cameras, complete comfort, like no pretense. I think he'd been this, you know, like in the public eye for so long that he just, so he was a great subject in that way. Like he was, anything I asked him to do, he was like, okay. (laughs) Um, But then I also, on, on, so on the other side of that, right. I imagine there is, there is a challenge if you look at like, compare Pete Souza as a character versus John Lewis as a character. So John Lewis, I'm sure, is much more comfortable being the focus of the camera right in front of his face, um, which in some ways is like, great, he's going he's gonna to know how to give you a great quote, but also it is going to be, might be a little bit more challenging to get those moments of vulnerability or authenticity or to paint him in that light that you saw him in, which is just like, here's this here's this full person and all his, his greatness and all his flaws. Um, so how did you think, how did you think about finding scenes or moments that show the kind of politician and the legend stripped away and just leaving him as a, either a family person or a homebody, whatever it is coming out to light. You know, um, a lot of filmmaking for me is figuring out where you want to put the person in the world and then seeing how they respond to the world. So for John Lewis, it was, we always see him in public. I wanted to be home with him. Um, We always see him like in Congress or making a speech or things like that. I wanted to see him with his family. You know, like we're all different with our family. That's who you really are. They don't let you be the congressman at home. <laughs> you are, they call him Robert. Like he's Robert to them. He's the boy who didn't do his share of the work. Like, you know, he's like whatever. So, so those are some things. And once, you know, he was really game for that. I don't know that anybody had ever spoken to his siblings. And, and I think that um, it was uh, what I noticed in doing that interview Uh, or filming that, that those couple of days with his family is how he sat back and he didn't need to be the center of attention. You know, sometimes you'll have a public person who can't stop being public. And he was like the complete opposite. He, if you, you know, like I would ask him questions, but um, he mostly is sitting and listening to his siblings Mm -hmm. and what a gift to hear what your family thinks of you, but also it was hard because he had to acknowledge that he caused a lot of pain in doing the work that meant so much to him. His family was so worried. And if you look back at the movie in that scene, you know, his brother like wipes the tear from his eyes. Like he's still, even though it's all worked out. Yeah. The stress of thinking. And, you know, remember like John Lewis was doing this in the time of Emmett Till where like you look at a white person the wrong way could get you killed. And that I think is really what they thought was going to happen to him. Yeah. You know, I think they really did not necessarily believe he would survive uh, because he was too outspoken. He was too aggressive. Um, And yet they supported him. I mean, like what grace. Yeah. It's it's like almost biblical. Like we are going to sacrifice our brother, our son, His mother did not feel that way. And as a mother, like I got that. His siblings were different. They saw something that was important that he was doing and they were able to kind of live through the pain of it. Hmm. And I thought that that was really, yeah, important to show. But to your point, I learned a lot about him and how he behaved in that interview. And I was like, oh, he's not doing this for limelight. He's not doing this for personal praise. This is like his calling, Mm. you know? So you learn something with every shoot. Yeah. When you're, when you're working with these individuals or main characters in your films, how often are you talking to them about like the, the type of access you want? Or are you saying to someone like John Lewis, Hey, 
you know, we see you in public all the time. I'm really going to want to spend a lot of time with you at home or with your family. And this is why, um, are you, are you constantly having those conversations with the main subjects about the type of access that you want and, and why you feel it's so important for the story? Um, you do have to have that conversation with people. Um, in this case, uh, Mr. Lewis was fine. Like I would be like, can I come to your house on Saturday? And he said, yes, you can. You know, like, <laughs> can I come to your office on Tuesday? Yes, you can. Like he was fine. He, I was, you know, he was like, I'm going to go meet with speaker Pelosi. And I was like, and his staff was like, no, you can't. Like, so <laughs> <laughs> he was a very, very open the thing about Mr. Lewis is he never questioned why I wanted to do anything. He just was like, could he do it on a schedule? He would do it. Okay. That was it. Like, and okay. he, I really appreciate that level of trust. And I know it's not that easy for everybody. So like Pete Sousa, on the other hand, was like <laughs> hammer and a chisel opening that mm. door. You know, like mm. he was very much a private person kind of, almost felt dragged into the public eye. He put himself there, but he, he really wanted to maintain his privacy. Like the first thing he said to me is like, it's not about me. Like you don't need to meet my family or anything. I was like, oh, Lordy Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, it took much more time for Pete to, there was a lot of negotiation with Pete, you know, like where we could be, um, what part of his private life we could show. Um, you know, and I understand that. He also was very protective of President Obama's um, uh, family. And so he, he was fine with all the pictures, you know. He took like 2 million pictures. <laughs> so we had a lot of pictures to choose from. I bet, I bet. But the, the pictures that he was the most sensitive about were of the Obama girls. Um, mm. And he was really like a tiger about those. And he was like, the first cut he, he saw, like I usually don't show cuts to people until they're pretty. I don't, I don't, I usually don't show the subject at all until it's like locked because right. most times people don't necessarily like it the first time they see it because they get an idea in their mind of what the movie is going to be. And it's never what they think. So it's really important to decide when you show your subject the movie. In Pete's case, um, because of security and because of um, he was the, the the restriction he had is he he didn't want us to mess with his images. Okay. So he had the opportunity to review the images. Well, he had to see the images in context. So at some point, he had to see the movie, and he was like there's way too many photos of the girls in here. Like he kind of freaked out um, about that. So um, he just was like giving me a really hard time about that. And finally I was like, Pete, what if I show it to me? He was like, Mrs. Obama will not like this. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, all right, what if I show it to her? And then he was like, what do you mean? I was like, what if I show it to her? I'll show her the sequence that you're worried about. And he was like, I think he thought I couldn't get to her. So he was mm. like, okay, if she's like, yeah, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I got it to her and she, she, she loved it. That's amazing. That's <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah. Um, for, for both, when I was watching both these films, one of the other kind of storytelling questions that was really coming up for me is how you are using, like wh how you are using the archive. So in the John Lewis being the old footage um, or in Pete Sousa's doc, in the Pete Sousa doc, his photography, how you are using archive as a signal or driver of what you should be filming in those present day scenes and how much are you letting the present day scenes dictate what images you take from Pete Souza or what scenes you go back and replay from John Lewis's life. Um, so in either one, whichever one you want to you're more inspired to take here um, um, yeah. with that you interplay. Know, I'm really interested in. Yeah. Um, I really love the interplay and it's, it's, it can be hard to do. Um, but um, I think it's so worth it. So like in John Lewis movie, I, I think I like to treat archive just the same way I treat Verite filming. So like, is there enough material so that the scene can stand on its own, you know, so that you're dropping into a scene and not seeing something in the background. 
So I really loved um, the archive with Julian Bond, like seeing John mm-hmm. Lewis and Julian Bond sitting together. That's not something that a lot of people were familiar with. Um, it, it, I think it humanizes him in that part of John Lewis is um, ambition. And, you know, we, when we try and think of like our saintly people, ambition is, is a funny thing for people. People get very yeah. uncomfortable if you say you're ambitious and he was ambitious and maybe he didn't treat his close friend really well because he really wanted to win. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's important that we grapple with that and say, because we're almost a part of that decision. We love John Lewis. What if he hadn't been mean to his friend, Julian Bond? He might not be here. So like, who's going to cast the first stone, you know, like that's, he did what he needed to do to win. I mean, what he did was, is almost quaint, like challenging him to take a drug test, you know, but at the time it was like, whoa, this is like, not what you're supposed to do. For Pete, the, some of the footage I love the most is um, the Reagan White House footage. Cause you see Pete in a much more tentative way. You see um, how he, he didn't personally, he, Pete loves President Obama. Like there's no doubt about that. They've spent so much time together for more than 10 years. They've been together as friends now. He didn't have that relationship with President Reagan. And yet he was able to observe a side of Reagan that people didn't see that often. And even though he disagreed with him politically, he could respect the person. And that is part of, to me, like what I want to communicate with Pete Susan movie is it's not a film about President Obama. It's a film about leadership and humanity. And that one of the most important qualities of a leader is their ability to have empathy. And so that we understand that they're doing their best. We may Mm. not agree with their decisions, but they really have something besides their own power as their goal. Hmm. So that is true for Reagan and for President Obama. Um, so, what was one of what was one of the most challenging parts of making the the way I see it? Um, I think well, we got shut down <laughs> in the pandemic, and I hadn't done. I like to do the kind of like main interview, like three quarters in, like and so why I'm is that? almost done. Well, I like to be able to ask the subject about some of the things that I've seen during the filming. So we'll do interviews along the way, but like in terms of like a soup to nuts, like where did you start? Where did you grow up? You know, kind of that full life interview. I like to do that when I know a lot about what I want them to. So we hadn't done that for Pete. And then we, Pete was very, very, um, He'd had some health issues. He was very strict about quarantine. And so we had to figure out how to do that remotely. (laughs) So first we tried Zoom. That was like, meh. Then, um, (laughs) yeah, we tried, we, um, what did we try next? We tried him self-filming and that was, eh, okay. And then we finally figured out, um, we, I had the DP, uh, uh, set all the settings on the camera and then send it to him like all ready to go. Oh, and wow. so he, he basically was, he put the camera on and then we would zoom and I would have the DP on and they would talk about the settings and the lenses and all of that. But he was the operator. Wow. Okay. So he was operating the camera. So we, we did the positioning. So we had like three screens going, here's what it looks like for Pete Pete had to be eye line with me. So it wasn't easy, but that worked really well. And be, wow. for him, because he was, he's comfortable with cameras. So he's fine with that, but he's not a videographer. So that was new to him. And he was like a little anxious about it. And so he would be like, how's this? How's this? How's this? <laughs> uh, so, so, but that was kind of fun. And then once we figured that out, then we actually, it ended up being kind of a, a, a benefit because as you know, it's expensive to film. It's hard to get on people's schedules, but everybody was home and he had this camera so we could do lots of little interviews. So we did a series. Usually I do like a big, like three or four hour kind of thing. 
my last over a couple of days, like this was like, we would do like two hours and then do two hours again and two hours again. So we had a lot more flexibility that way. And he, he likes cameras and he likes talking gear. Mm -hmm. So it was like kind of fun. And how did covering the story of a, a documentarian or someone who's trying to document the most authentic version of this incredibly public figure, how did documenting a documentarian make you reflect on your own practice? Um, I was really envious of Pete's uh, access and time because the, the, the thing that's the most important for me as a documentarian is really, you just have to put the time in. You just have to be with people. And it's, those, it's a collection of small moments that give you the best impression of the whole. So, you know, there's, people talk about the golden age of documentary, which is true. There's a lot of interest, the budgets are higher, but that comes at a cost, which is people want you to finish things quickly. And so it's very hard to, you know, Gideon's Army, my first film, I spent three years filming. So there's, you know, like what ends up in that movie is like, called, you know, from such a wealth of possible moments. Mm -hmm. And with, when you have a much shorter filming opportunity, you, it's much harder to get into that. And I think Pete was frustrated that he was like, he was with Obama every day. And like, we can't afford to be with everybody every day. Like, yeah. even if I could have the time, like we, we can't afford that with the cinematographers that we like. Right. So we had to like pick and choose moments. And I think he was like, why aren't you with me all the time? Like you should be with me all the time. And I was like, I'd love to be with you all the time, but I can't make that work. So I think that that's kind of a challenge for today's documentarians um, is, you know, the love of our genre is putting pressure on, on us to conform to much faster time schedules. Mm. And is that, is that a pressure that's being put from like the places that are funding documentaries? I think um, it's like a crisis of opportunity. You know, there's like, if you have somebody who's greenlit something and they're willing to go, like you, you just make it work but it's not always ideal, you know, I'd much rather like move to Timbuktu and live with somebody for <laughs> a long time. Yeah. But, um, you know, so, you know, it's interesting. I think that there is, um, I think that there, you're gonna, I think that it's gonna be very interesting to see what kind of films come out next year. Okay. You know, what's the 20, what are going to be the films of 2020? Certainly a lot of pandemic films, but maybe not, you know, I'm wondering if this time at home is giving people the, that desire for slowing things down a little bit, you know, really leaning into story instead of yeah. gimmick stuff. Absolutely. I, I hope that that's the case, you know? Yeah. It was interesting the timing that I saw the way I see it because I had I had just finished doing this workshop which is called the Missouri Photo Workshop and I'm primarily a, a documentary filmmaker video journalist but I'm trying to flex my photography skills and get better at that craft as well and the Missouri Photo Workshop is one of the oldest documentary photo workshops in the U.S. and I got into it and the first directive that we really had for this week long experience was to find a story and really the 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 whole challenge and the types of images that they wanted to see from us were like quiet moments were those were those uh just yeah i guess quiet those personal those intimate moments and coming from a job that i'm doing right now which is I'm covering news, like I'm covering wildfires here in California. And, you know, to get that interview with the Cal Fire person, it's like, I'm in, I'm out. Everyone knows I'm there. Um, I'm not, you know, blending in at, at any point. And I just had such an appreciation coming out of that week 
for even even like you know I was with this family for this story for like three days and to see on that third day how they kind of just started to lose the novelty of like me being there and to weigh that my images change it's the magic right yeah do you have it yeah yeah. no I I I know exactly what you mean and um it it is like the thing that we strive for you know and that's that's why I'm so envious of Pete that he had like it's not that President Obama didn't know he was there but he wasn't thinking about him all the time you Mm -hmm. know he wasn't like posing for him Mm -hmm. and so you know what will eventually become public are all of those images so like you can go see them and see what was happening on a specific day and and what he was documenting and that's you know that there is that moment like where you like most people there's i i can think of like two exceptions maybe just one most of my subjects, eventually they let their guard down. They just mm. like, it just gets boring to try and pose yeah. <laughs> for that long. Yeah. Yeah. There's one notable exception, but for most people after a while, um, they really just understand they can't control everything. They stop trying and that's when you get the best stuff. That also though, you know, I have learned can happen in an interview and it, depends on how you set up the interview. So like, even if you only have one shot with somebody, you can get pretty intimate with people. Where so they what really are some strategies can... that you use to, to kind of have success with that? Um, with a lot of people, I try and start out with something, like if I'm talking to an expert, mm-hmm. I'll start out with like, where did you grow up? <laughs> Yeah, and they're like, "Where did I grow up? What does that have to do with crazy tea?" <laughs> they're like, "That's like, not why you emailed me." Background, like, I'm interested in you. So then they start talking about something that they know very well. Okay. And for most people, when they start talking about where they grew up, they think about the good part of their childhood, and so it relaxes them. And they're like, "Oh, I can tell a story." Da da da. da. And then I try and like kind of obliquely get to the subject matter, but I never start with it first. Um, you know, for um, for celebrity people, um, I, I like I usually start with like thanking them because um, I have a little bit of a sense of like time is their biggest commodity, and people always want something from them. And so just acknowledging that, you know, their time really is important and like, it's not a little thing. Um, And then I do try and find like a way to talk about something real. Like if you're a celebrity, I I think that a lot of times there's a craving to talk about something real. I think almost there's a craving to not be a celebrity for people to see your humanity. And so I try and find something that reflects that, or I'll tell them something about me. You know, I'll I'll say like, you know, when I grew up, I was blah, 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 blah. A lot of people are very, they, they actually don't want to talk about themselves all the time. And they kind of like, they like exhale, like, oh my God, I don't have to be like, (laughs) yeah. Focus. Um, right. It's not an interrogation. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. So everybody just wants to be a person, you know, mm-hmm. and like, mm-hmm. if you demonstrate that you respect them for their humanity, they usually really appreciate that. Um, yeah. So. For people out there who are like me and have aspirations directing documentaries i'm curious if you had to tease out some of the characteristics that you think have made you successful as a director what are some things that you'd um offer as like focus on this or think about this this is why you know i've been able to to take the ride that i have in my career what are some what are some of those characteristics as a director of documentaries you think are really important yeah i think i think i'm a really good listener you know, I think like 
really thinking about why you're making the film you're making. And I like to have like an animating question. So like for the public defenders, it was, why would anyone do this job? Help me understand that. Like you have low pay, you're not respected. You sometimes come in contact with really violent people who most people don't want to think about. Why are you running towards that instead of away from it? Like everybody else. And just like, um, you know, for, for Pete, it was, um, what made you speak up? You know, like, what did you see? It was so important to you that you literally could not sit by the sidelines. You couldn't just speak with your pictures anymore. You had to speak with your words. You had to come out of the shadows. What was, what was that? And for him, it was a cumulative years of seeing a leader really try hard to make a difference for people. And he just was appalled and scared. He knew what it took to be a good government person. And he was like, this guy has no qualifications. <laughs> so I think like listening is, is a big thing. And then I think um, it's uh, finding the right team, cultivating the right team. So like, I like to shoot with the same people. We know each other for better or worse. Like, you know, they know, I know that they get like what frustrates them and that they're going to be like, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then they always do it. Like, I know that now. Um, I also know that I trust them completely. Like anybody that I bring into a room with somebody who's going to tell a hard story, I know that that person will keep their confidence and that they will do everything in their power to make that person feel comfortable. So like I, I would never bring somebody I didn't trust a hundred percent into a room with somebody who I knew was going to tell a tough story. So, Mm -hmm. so cultivating your team. And then like my personal thing is like finding people who are great at what they do and then figuring out like how to make it even better for them. Like I don't edit. How to set them up for success. Yeah. Yeah. I don't shoot. So like, what do the editors need? You know, like saying, no, I want to hear what you think about the footage. I'm not like telling you what to do. I want to, you know, I want to work this through together. Like, what are we saying here? What are we saying here? Um, But then I think the final thing is every decision is on your shoulders. You can't, if something goes wrong, it's your fault. (laughs) It's literally your fault. Mm -hmm. And you just got to accept that. And, Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that with all the like, yeah, you're the director comes all the responsibility. So like, if you don't put the right team together, you don't have everything you need for your shoot, your budget's not on time. It's your fault. It's right. always your fault. <laughs> right. And, and doing that, like you have to accept the good with the bad. So a lot of documentary filmmaking is creating spaces for people to do their jobs and then creating space for your subject to tell their story and finding it as, and then the last thing I would say is, can you say that again? Just want to make sure I, I got that. You, you really need to create a space for someone to tell their story. And like, for me, a lot of it is figuring out how can I help this person get to a place where they feel comfortable enough to talk, right? where they, where they're going to go beyond the surface. What can mm-hmm. I do? Is it the place of the interview? Is it spending mm-hmm. time with them before? Is it who I have in the room filming with them? Um, all of those things matter. So if you're going to ask somebody to talk about an assault, you can't have 40 people in the room. You know, they're not actors. If you're going to have, um, if you're going to have a politician open up, like you've got to show that you're trustworthy with whatever they're going to tell you. You also want to show that you respect them enough to have done your, your homework. You know, people love when you've read the book and when you <laughs> right. watch the movie, um, like that stuff is really important and you get different answers. If you've read the book and watched the movie, um, you get, you get better answers if you're prepared. So. Yeah. Amazing. Well, so last couple last couple questions for you here before I'll let you go on with your day. Um, I guess the, the first is, what are 
you know, these, these two films have a lot of overlaps that we talked about in the beginning of this interview, especially thematically. And I'm wondering for you next with the stories that maybe you're working on right now or the stories that are coming in the future, what are some of the big questions, those animating questions that you talked about or themes that you feel like, mm, I, I, I want to keep digging into that. I want to keep finding the, the stories that are really going to bring that bring that to life. What, what's on your mind when it comes to that? Um, I'm really curious about the, how did we get here questions, you know, like filling in, I feel like it's like, it's like we're watching, if you're like, we're watching a picture, only part of it is in color. And there's all these details that have been overlooked. And so, you know, like, how did, you know, like understanding how everyone is racist. <laughs> like, how did that happen? Right. What are the building blocks to that? And it's such a multi-layered story. It's um, that I think if you, if you look at all the ways that certain groups have been excluded, you start to see like how we're all impacted by a particular narrative. And so, you know, I, I feel like it's a great relief to excavate truths, you know, and that, so I'm interested in doing that. Like, what are some of the hidden histories that m help us understand how we've gotten to where we are to be so divided? So, yeah, so that's what I'm interested in. Fantastic. Um, before I finish with my last question, where can we where can we send uh, people to check out these movies? To check out you, where should we send people? Social media, whatever you wanna, whatever you yeah. wanna share. Um, yes, no, I um, so I uh, the way I see it is on Peacock and Apple, iTunes and Amazon. Um, John Lewis movie is on HBO Max, um, also iTunes and Amazon. Um, I'm on Twitter at Don Porter um, and Instagram and Facebook. Well, Facebook's kind of like more for my friends. <laughs> A lot of pictures of my kids. So there you um, go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Fantastic. And the last question that I always end all these interviews on is just if there's one last piece of advice that you'd give for people who want to become better storytellers, what is one last piece of advice that you would offer? Um, I think it's really important to have something to say, like really have something to say, you know, movie making is so difficult financing and access and travel and all the tiny little logistics that go into, to it. Um, so it should be worth it. It should be worth your time and the audience's time and your subject's time. Mm. But when you go into it, like, what is it you are gonna add to this conversation. What are you trying to say? Like have something to say. Beautiful. Don Porter, thank you so much for joining the show. Yeah, thank you, for, that was fun. Thanks for having me.